Uh, okay, my name is Dao Wei Luo, and I'm from UBC. I'm a postdoc working with Dr. Tony Wang and Greg Onio, and I will be the moderator for this session. And our next speaker will be Rafael Candido, and he's a PhD candidate from UBC working with Sally Atkin. And please join me and welcome him. Okay, so can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you, Doe. Um, so my name is Rafael. I'm a PhD candidate in forestry at UBC and uh, with Dr. Sally Aitken. And um, I study climate adaptation in Douglas fir and how this might translate into adaptive potential to future climatic conditions. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, part of my research project. Before I get started, I would like to acknowledge that I leave, I work, and I play on the unceded and traditional territories of the Muscan people, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, I would also like to acknowledge and thank these amazing scientists and collaborators and say that without them, this whole project wouldn't be possible at all. So thank you to them. Um, I hope I don't have to convince anybody in this room here that climate is changing at an unprecedented pace. Um, and with that, uh, extreme events such as droughts are becoming more frequent, more intense, and in some parts of the world, even longer. Um, this is just a snapshot of uh, a couple of years ago in North America when um, about 50% of the whole territory was being affected by some kind of drought. And as you can see in Western North America, we can see that the droughts are very um, extreme. Um, with that, mortality is increasing and productivity is decreasing, and we expect that to be more and more intense uh, as we move forward with climate change. And this is not different um, in Western North America where uh, Douglas fir occurs. Um, needless to say, but Douglas fir is a very, very important species ecologically, but also economically, not only here in Western North America, but in other parts of the world where it's planted. So there's, there's an increase in the interest uh, in understanding um, what is the potential variation, what is the potential, um, uh, the, the adaptive potential that Douglas fir has to those more extreme environmental conditions. Um, also, there, is um, many, many uh, approaches being proposed over the years um, to help tackling the effects of climate change or to mitigate the effects of climate change on um, temperate conifers specifically. Um, among them, assisted gene flow and selective breeding. However, in order for these approaches to be um, applied and um, used effectively, we definitely have to better understand what are the trades uh, involved in adaptation to those more extreme events, what are, for example, the genes underpinning those uh, adaptations, but also what are the, the, the regions more at risk, what are the regions or the populations that harbor um, potential, ad, uh, adaptive potential or variation as adaptive potential to those more extreme events. Um, and finally, also, what are the climatic drivers to those to adaptations or uh, to those more extreme events? Um, we conducted a couple of experiments, a couple of common garden experiments, trying to answer some of those questions. Um, and we studied drought tolerance and cold hardness from populations across the range of the two varieties. And one of the main findings of those two common gardens that we established was that um, most of the variation for these two traits um, is actually within populations or within provenances. A little bit less of that for cold hardness, but definitely for drought tolerance. So with that information in mind, I asked this first question here. Can we use that um, within population variation to try to identify um, ad adaptive um, variants associated with those traits uh, for Douglas fir? And if the answer for this first question is yes, um, can we model or can we predict the distribution of that genomic information associated with those two traits across the range of the species? Um, 
And finally, um, and also very importantly, um, we know that breeding programs for Douglas fir are very, very important um, in Western North America. Um, so we also wanted to understand and, and know if selective breeding for growth and volume would have any effect or, on those clim climate adaptive traits. Um, so for the first question, we conducted an experiment. Um, so we selected 20 populations across the range of both varieties. Um, and we planted 80 seedlings from each of those populations in boxes like this in the greenhouse. And we submitted these boxes to an extreme drought conditions, condition, so um, drought to death. So we monitored those plants using um, chlorophyll fluorescence until they died. Um, and this is basically an indication of decline in the photosynthetic efficiency responding to this, this stress. Um, so with that approach, and here I have just one example, let's say provenance one from the eastern, eastern side of, the, of Vancouver Island here, um, submitted this box to extreme drought conditions. We um, evaluated and extracted the drought tolerance index from, for each individual within that population. We ranked the individuals uh, from each of those populations. And with this approach, we were able to identify two very separate uh, phenotypic groups within each population, um, which we are calling here cases and controls. We did that for all the 20 populations. Um, we tested for the difference between cases and controls within each population, and we saw that it was highly significant. We did that also for cold hardness, where we evaluated in a, in a second, in another experiment, um, the cold injury um, on a similar, oops, sorry, on a similar number of seedlings. Um, and to do that, we evaluated the electrolyte leakage after artificial freezing, so we evaluate um, cold injury and ranked and did the same kind of analysis, separated cases and controls. Um, this is the workflow of the, of the work. So basically for the two trades, we identified cases and controls. We extracted the DNA for, uh, from those individuals, cases and controls within each population. We formed pool, uh, pools of DNA, uh, submitted those pools to uh, sequencing, so we conducted a pool-seek approach using exome capture. We called the SNPs using the reference genome for those fur. Um, and then we observed, the, we tested for the association between the allele frequencies that we observed within each of those groups within populations um, with the groups that they belong to based on the phenotype. So this is basically what we are calling here case and control GWAS. With that approach, we were able to identify a large number, thousands of SNPs associated with those traits for both varieties and uh, for both traits except for cold hardness in coastal Douglas fir. We looked at the position of, the, of those SNPs within the genome to see if we could identify potential candidate genes. Um, so what I'm calling genes here are transcriptomic contigs. We did that, and one of the conclusions of that, what we can say is that the two traits are highly, highly polygenic, so hundreds of genes involved um, in those adaptations. Um, a second point, surprisingly, but not so surprisingly if we consider the level of polygenicity of the traits, but there's little overlap between the two varieties for these NIPs that we identified there, between the two varieties. Um, so using those, um, that genomic information, can we um, predict across the landscape what is the distribution of that, of that information. So what we did was we uh, took those NIPs that we identified, oops, sorry. We took those NIPs that we identified based on the JUAS approach. Um, we went to, again, to natural populations across the range, but now we selected 73 nat natural population, uh, populations. Some of them are the same that we used for the case control to us, but in, with an independent sample. Um, and then we used a, an approach called gradient forest to train a model based on the climatic information from each population 
Um, and we tried to predict what would be the genomic information based on that climatic information. Um, and then we predicted for across the range of the two varieties. Um, and here is the main result. So we can see that similar colors represent um, the same genomic composition for each trait uh, within one or the other variety. Those two, the two varieties were modeled separately. Um, and one cool thing that we can also extract from such approach is that we can see what are the potential climatic variables that are the most important in explaining that genomic information. Um, for both trades in coastal Douglas fir was um, a variable uh, related to evapotranspiration, and for interior Douglas fir continentality was the most important variable there. We can move forward with that um, and do the same kind of predictions into the future using um, climatic predictions, uh, climate change climatic predictions, um, and use a comparison and do a comparison between the future predictions with the current predictions to see if there is a expected change in that genomic composition because of climate change. Or in other words, words what are the regions that need the most change in order to cope with the, the climatic conditions of the future? So something that we call, uh, that is called genomic offsets or genetic offsets or even genomic vulnerability. And we were able to identify some regions here in darker colors that are relatively uh, to, the, to the range of the species, to the other parts of the range, um, maybe more uh, at risk of maladaptation into the future. So we went a step further and we looked for positive effect alleles, so alleles that have a positive effect on the traits that we measured here, drought tolerance and cold hardness. And we looked for um, associations with individual climatic variables using those positive effect alleles. And this, I should mention that this work was inspired by Colin Mahoney and collaborators, um, some of them from our lab. Um, and we did that for both trades, for both varieties. And what is interesting here is that, um, that I found the most interesting thing is that for traits that have a higher signal of local adaptation or they show clines with the phenotype, for example, cold hardness in interior Douglas fir, when we group those allele frequencies that explain most of the variation in the trait, we don't see any clines in the allele frequencies. On the other hand, when we look at a trait that we at least at the, the, the scale we sample for, we, we don't, uh, for phenotypes that we don't see much of a cline or much of a signal of local adaptation, for example, drought tolerance in, in coastal lowlands fur, we started seeing some um, clusters of positive effect alleles that show patterns of clines. So this is very interesting. I'm still um, investigating further what, what could explain that. But um, a recent paper by um, Lauterhaus, Katie Lauterhaus um, in, P in PNAS suggests that there is a potential for um, genetic redundancy. In other words, maybe different sets of genes are producing the same phenotype in different populations. So this might be one of multiple explanations for these uh, patterns. And finally, um, we wanted to see the effects of selective breeding uh, for growth, for volume, on those adaptive traits on cold hardness and drought tolerance. So, and I should mention that this work was inspired by um, Ian uh, McLaughlin, you, most of you uh, know him, um, and collaborators. And he showed um, a couple of years ago that in lodgepole pine, when you select for growth, you might have an impact, you might see a, a shift, a substantial shift in the proportion of those positive effect alleles um, for cold injury. Thank you. Um, so we did a similar thing here. Um, we selected, or, oops, sorry, orchard populations um, of Douglas fir in, um, on the coast and also in the interior. And we also sample natural populations to compare with those at orchard populations. Um, a very similar ap approach to Ian's. Um, and we, of course, called those NIPs that we identified 
using the case control GWAS on those populations to see if there are differences. Um, I should mention that the archer populations that we used were also second generation, so two generations of selection for growth. So there is using a very simple comparison between the distribution of those positive effect alleles. Selecting for growth in Douglas fir has uh, at least indication uh, that, that, that it has no impact on the distribution of positive effect alleles associated with drought tolerance in either variety. However, agreeing, agreeing with the results of, of, Ian's, of Ian and collaborators, we also see a um, shift in the distribution of positive effect alleles for, um, for cold hardness um, after two generations of selection for growth. So this is something very important to consider moving forward in, uh, in the breeding programs. Um, so just to summarize here, um, some of our findings, um, draw tolerance and cold hardness are highly polygenic. We identify multiple uh, loci associated with the two traits. Um, and there is little overlap between the two varieties for the loci that we identify there, potentially because of the polygenicity there. Um, also, that we were able with this approach to identify uh, regions that are at relative risk of maladaptation or that need potentially more change in the uh, allelic composition to cope with climate change. And there is a uh, potential of genetic redundancy for those traits that we study there. And finally, that there is no, uh, or indications here that there's no effect of selective breeding on um, the positive effect alleles associated with drought tolerance, which is a very good news, so it's, it's really good to know, but um, there is an effect in the distribution of positive effect alleles associated with drought tolerance, and that's something very important to consider. So with that, I would like to, to thank all these amazing people who helped me in a way or the other. Of course, my little beautiful daughter here, Flora. Um, but um, yeah, that provided seeds, helped me measuring the experiments, helped me with uh, bioinformatics and so on. So thank you very much. And I would also like to thank the uh, sponsors and also um, partners of the Coadapt Pre project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a very nice presentation, and we have two and a half minutes, maybe four or two quick questions. Okay, uh, super nice work. Um, I wonder if, for your um, GEA analysis, you're identifying a subset of adaptive alleles and then looking at their frequencies across the landscape, et cetera. I wonder if instead of using a subset of adaptive alleles found in a case control, you did something like a genomic prediction of the breeding value for environment for your populations. Do you think you would see a different pattern for your genomic vul vulnerability and maybe differences in the clients, adaptive clients across the landscape? I don't know. Um, this was, I think, the work that was um, similar work done in Oaks in California, and they saw, they saw that. Um, I don't know. I, that would be nice to test here, too. So I don't know. Okay, maybe one more quick question. Hi, great talk, thanks. Um, I was just curious uh, why you decided to use a case controlled GWAS instead of treating phenotype as a continuous variable? Because we didn't have, um, well, we didn't have much money to, to genotype many, many individuals. So if you um, can do that in pools, and that's why we pulled the extremes of the phenotypes we transformed, pretty much transformed the, the trade into a binary trade um, in order to be able to sequence the pools. Otherwise, we would have to sequence all the individuals within and capture all the variation in the population. But um, yeah, pretty much okay, because of that. Okay, I understand you never type the ones. Uh, yeah, and that phenotypes. Yeah, and that increases the, the, the power of the analysis. Otherwise, if I had the same number of, sequ of sequences for individuals, for individual genomic uh, genotypes, 
I wouldn't have the power to capture that. Um, so that's why. It makes sense. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, our, okay, our next you got mic. presenter will be Laura Manoros. She's from University of Alberta. And she's going to share with us another very exciting topic about uh, pathosystem. And please join me and welcome her. Time is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. So I'm excited today to talk about some ongoing research that I'm doing on comparative and population genomics of the, pop of the Cronartium Parknesii pine pathosystem. So for those of you who are not familiar with this pathosystem, Cronartium Parknesii is a pathogen that is the causative agent of a disease known as Western gall rust, which you probably heard something about this past week. Uh, it's unlike other rust fungi in that it's an autoecious fungus, so it completes its entire life cycle on one single host. And that life cycle starts as these aceospores. They're spread from tree to tree with vectors such as the wind. They'll directly infect a tree through the epidermis, and then two to four months after that, that infection, a globo swelling will form, also known as a gall. And then two to four years after that infection, the bark will slough off, reveal these aceospores, which will then continue to spread and continue the life cycle. So Cronartium parknesii has a range of all over North America. But to put it into perspective for us here in BC, uh, 20 million hectares have been lost to this disease in BC alone. As well, the most virulent variant of the the uh, pathogen is found in BC, and it has the most impact in young trees because the gall makes up a larger percentage of the tree's mass, at, oh, as you can see here. And this is problematic for uh, replanting efforts. So my project focuses on the two most prominent hosts of sea hark in Canada, so the lodgepole pine, which has a, which has a range of throughout the Rocky Mountains and west. It has a preference for higher elevations and moister soils. And then jack pine, which has a range of starting east of the Rocky Mountains throughout most of eastern Canada with preferences for lower elevations and drier soils. And then interestingly, uh, in northern Alberta, northern BC, and northwest territories, where the lodgepole pine and jack pine ranges overlap, they form a mosaic hybrid zone. So in this zone, you can find lodgepole and jack pine hybrids, as well as the pure species, depending on which ecological niche is present in the area. So now getting into some recent research coming out of our lab. A structure analysis of samples of sea hark taken from across Canada reveals that there are actually two distinct variants of this pathogen. So an eastern variant, which can be seen here in the blues, and a western variant, which can be seen here in yellow. Uh, and then when those sampling locations were overlaid onto the range map of the pine species, we can see that the eastern variant co-localizes with the jack pine range, and the western variant co-localizes with the lodgepole range. In the same study, they also did a greenhouse inoculation trial, looking at different phenotypes of the disease. Uh, you should just focus on the yellow bars here, which are galls that have been formed. So I'm going to go over the three main findings from this inoculation trial. So the first is that the western variant of C. harknesii is more virulent than the eastern variant. That is, it induces or creates more galls, gall formation. The second is that jack pine shows more quantitative resistance than lodgepole pine. Uh, also, we have a yet-to-be-published GWAS study that shows that resistance is, in fact, a polygenic trait. And then finally, lodgepole and jack pine hybrids show an intermediate response between the two pure species. 
So where does that leave us now? They, these are the two hypotheses that we want to test going forward in my research. The first being that there are genomic differences between the Eastern variant and the Western variant of C. harkness-i that incurred, uh, confer increased virulence in the Western variant relative to the Eastern variant. And the second, that within the hybrid zone, we expect stands to be dominated by either the Western variant or either the Eastern variant, and we expect few, if any, stands to contain both variants. We also do not expect there to be any introgression between both variants. So to attack this hypothesis and to test this hypothesis, we're taking sort of a two-factor approach, looking at a comparative genomic analysis and a population genomic analysis. Starting with the comparative genomic analysis, our first objective here is is to annotate the JAF genomes of the eastern and western variants of C. arachnesii. So recently in our lab, we have developed a draft genome assembly for both variants, and the structural annotation of both of those genomes was actually pretty straightforward. Um, unfortunately, and for those of us who work in non-model organisms, uh, the functional annotation has not been so straightforward. So if we're looking at a common uh, functional annotation algorithm, uh, we get only 12.2% annotation. And for something like BLAST, we're commonly getting returns of uncharacterized proteins or uh, hypothetical proteins. So going forward, we're planning to take a more individualized approach. So data mining, many different functional annotation programs uh, and combining them to get a more complete functional annotation. So the second objective here is that we want to identify genomic differences between the two variants. So we started with doing a structural or a sequence comparison between the two variants. And if you can see here on the left, there are a lot of sequence similarities between the two, but what I find more interesting is the figure on the right, which shows the differences. So there are some pretty major translocations here, and as well, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a possible whole chromosome difference between the two variants, um, which I will come into play later on. So finally, the third objective here is to discover candidate loci for differential, and vari vari differential virulence. Um, so we would really like to apply this to our differential expression in transcriptomic analysis. Um, as an example here, if we're looking at uh, just fungal transcripts from whole stem samples, we can see at the 21 days post-inoculation mark that there's a consistently higher amount of fungal transcripts in the lodgepole pine samples than the jack pine samples. So it'll be really interesting to see what genes are differentially expressed here and how they relate to virulence. So getting into the population genetic side, if we remember, I just showed this map a couple slides ago. Some of the um, literature has been missing a really thorough sampling in this hybrid zone, specifically ones that have the ancestry of the tree and the identity of the variant, which is problematic for what we now know is a mosaic hybrid zone, and we now know that there are two variants that exist. So our goal is to have a more robust sampling in this zone in order to answer our, these burning outstanding questions such as, does the eastern variant ever infect lodgepole pine? Does the western variant ever infect jack pine? Can both variants result in separate galls in the same tree at the same time? Which variants can infect hybrids? And do we see evidence of east and west variant intermediates? So to start, our first objective here is obviously to get a robust sampling of galls and foliage from stands across Alberta. So in the summer of 2022, we went and did that. We got um, 
just around 800 galls from just over 300 trees from a sampling transect across Alberta that goes through the lodgepole pine range, the hybrid zone, as well as the jack pine range in Alberta. So the second objective here is to genotype host pine and pathogen C. harknessii samples and to perform data analysis. So for our ancestry determination of our pine foliage, we have a previously developed uh, diagnostic SNP genotype that will be used. And then for our spore variant discrimination, we'll be using previously developed EST-based microsatellites. And then our current data analysis plan is just to perform the classic population genetic analysis, so structure, PCA, and then those in combination with some arch look uh, modeling with ArcGIS, just to look at the population differentiation of C. harknessii in Alberta, the population admixture of C. harknessii within stands, and the biogeography of C. harknessii together with the pine species and populations throughout Alberta. So then finally, our third objective here is to develop a PCR assay to discriminate between variants. So this is arguably one of um, the most exciting things or most exciting parts of the project for me. So if we can go back to this diagram here, uh, where we can see all the translocations between the two variants, we're going to be trying to design primers for these regions. Hopefully we can develop a more accessible, a more cost-effective, um, and easier way to distinguish between the two variants using PCR. So my parting thoughts is one, that there are genomic differences between the two variants, uh, and it will be exciting to see how those differences relate to the differential virulence in our transcriptomic analysis. The second is that there are many resources for non-model organisms. As a bioinformatician, I really appreciate all the open source and sharing of resources between the two communities. It's really helped for the progress on my project. And third is that data suggests that tree improvement through genomic selection is possible uh, with the caveat that we need to know more about the virulence and resistance relationship of this pathosystem. So I would like to thank my funding sources, NSERC, the Alberta government, and Alberta in Innovates Biosolutions, as well as I would like to thank the members of the Cook Lab uh, and those who have helped with this project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It seems we have time for a couple of questions here. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting, as I'm from Alberta as well. Um, uh, when you took your transect across Alberta and the hybrid zone and the jack pine and um, logical pine zone, did you take um, samples from naturally regenerated stands um, from fire or old growth, or did you take them from plantations? So funny you should ask that because I was thinking about that this morning. Um, I don't know for sure, but um, given that some were in logging areas, I think some were not for sure, but others were like natural areas, so yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I noticed that you had uh, two variants, two strains on the on the east. Uh, is there any sequencing that was done on uh, looking at the differences there? Yeah. So there's using our our ESTs. They distinguish between like the east and the west, but there isn't like a s actual significant difference between that third one. So there's no virulence between these two east strains? No. Okay. 
more questions? No. Okay, we are ahead of the time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. okay, our next speaker is Tao Shalif, and uh, he's from UBC, and uh, he will talk about uh, genomics of Western red cedar towards improved genetic resilience in a self compatible conifer. And please welcome him. Not quite. Okay. How's everyone doing? Uh, just eight three eight. Yeah. How's everyone doing? Still awake? <laughs> Waiting to catch a flight. Um, I, I just want to thank the organizers here because you know it's not easy putting on a big thing like this. So especially big thanks to Nick and and Brian and all the other organizers here. Um, Okay, yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm, I'm Tal. I'm a postdoc at University of British Columbia, uh, where I live and work on the lands, unceded lands of the uh, Musqueam people. But, you know, work is carried out all over the province and uh, samples are from all over the place. So, you know, we have samples from the lands of the uh, Cowichan, uh, the Tsuk, and the uh, Namgish, and also um, Plamin uh, peoples. So uh, yeah, we're very uh, grateful to have the ability to work and live in, these, in this beautiful uh, province. Uh, and I'm hoping to talk about you know, what is more or less kind of the last 10 years of work that we've been doing on Western Red Cedar. Um, so this work, yeah. Uh, Western Red Cedar, Cooper Sacier, uh, I guess I don't give it too much introduction. It's pretty uh, uh, popular around here. Uh, very important culturally, ecologically, economically um, uh, in British Columbia. Uh, so, of course, very uh, well known for its use in uh, cultural artifacts, totems, art. Um, this is my son a few years, uh, quite a few years back at the uh, Museum of Anthropology at UBC, so there's lots of, uh, lots of cool stuff there. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, hugely valued for its uh, use as a building material, uh, naturally rot resistant, so used both contemporarily, uh, but also in traditional uh, First Nations um, uh, building. It uh, tends to be a stress tolerator, uh, so it, it tolerates quite low light environments, water surplus nutrient deficiency, um, thrives in wet, cool climates. Um, as, as we're learning uh, lately, doesn't do so well in very, very dry or hot climates, but that's, that's a matter for another day. I'm not going to be talking about that right now. Uh, well, I'll talk about it a little bit here. Um, it is expected to change its range over, over the next few decades, um, and as we see it kind of expanding into areas where it might be more uh, cool or wet, um, we are, are kind of planning as um, moving it away from its, its, its natural range, where we're seeing that it is going to likely be disappearing from the southern parts of its range. And this is actually quite important because it is, um, well, a lot of the evidence points to that it has uh, originally actually originated from a single refugium right about here at the south part of its range. And then since the last glaciation uh, has spread uh, all the way north and into the interior. So we're losing a lot of that kind of area where you might have slightly more variation. But um, yeah, that's also another a matter for a different day. So part of that is, um, is, is actually together with its, its very unique mating system. So how did it spread from you know, that one glacial refugium all the way north? Well, one of the biggest um, factors likely pointing towards that is that it has a very uh, mixed mating system, average outcrossing rate of about 70%, so probably one of the lowest, if not uh, the lowest for a conifer. Um, and together with that, it has a very short generation time. So these likely due to a high self-pollen receptivity, low self-embryo abortion, and very minimal inbreeding depression for fitness traits that we observe in, in these natural populations. And in fact, um, so John Russell, who's just in this picture, who, who was the uh, provincial breeder for Western Red Cedar, had um, actually was actually able to induce uh, selfing in Western Red Cedar for uh, five generations, so five complete generations within about 10 years. Um, again, minimal inbreeding depression for fitness traits, and this is actually a hugely important resource that we uh, use in a lot of the um, research that I'm going to show right now. So when we're focusing on the genomics, we had a few stages that we wanted to go through. 
Um, obviously, the first most important one is developing genomic resources. Um, so all the different types of genomic resources, I'm going to touch on that. Um, we had a lot of interest, of course, based on its mating system and its um, uh, population history, uh, understanding a bit more about the um, genetic diversity and understanding a bit more about um, how kind of selfing uh, might have evolved or, might have, uh, or, or what the ramifications of selfing have been at the gene uh, genomic level in Western Red Cedar. And then uh, utilizing some of this genomic data in uh, applying towards genomic selection um, and better understanding uh, tr key traits of economic interest in Western Red Cedar. So one of the great things about having these selfing lines is they're kind of invaluable for, uh, for, for uh, sequencing. Uh, why is that? Well, we have these S5, fifth, so fifth generation, completely self-fertilized seedlings, and they are essentially greater than 98% homozygous, so that's just by the properties of, of selfing. Um, why is this important? Well, high heterozygosity can lead to very uh, fragmented, bloated assemblies, which a lot of people who might have worked on uh, se uh, sequencing the assembling genomes in other conifers might be aware of. Um, and so these seedlings, we were able to use them for uh, reference transcriptome and also reference genome assembly. Um, I think someone mentioned before, uh, but we actually have probably one of the highest currently uh, in terms of BUSCO scores, which are benchmarking uh, single, uh, universal single copy orthologs. Um, it's one of the highest completeness scores of any conifer genome that's currently available, including, um, including uh, genomes that have a full chromosome scale assembly, such as a sequoia dendron gigantium, a giant sequoia. And uh, we've assembled about 10 gigabase pairs out of the 12 or, 12 or 13 gigabase pairs uh, that are assumed to be in, in the genome and uh, at an N50 of about 2.3. So highly contiguous for a, what is, is, is actually a short read uh, uh, assembled genome, 68,000 scaffolds, um, and that's just within the, this was actually within the first draft and then we're at the third draft right now. Um, and of course, this is a, all a collaborative work. It's not just one person or one group doing it. So we had a lot of the sequencing uh, work done at the JGI uh, together with Hudson Alpha um, under the guidance of uh, Jeremy Schmutz. And then um, uh, the genome assembly software being developed and the genome assembly being carried out at the uh, BC Genome Science Center uh, in, uh, in Dr. Birol's lab, Dr. Nancy Birol's lab. Um, right, and then finally, we also wanted to do targeted genotyping for genomic selection. Um, and so we had 57,000 probes that were designed using transcriptomic and genomic data. Um, and finally selecting 20,000 probes for uh, uh, SNP genotyping, single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, and calling 54,000 SNPs across, uh, uh, call, managed to call 54,000 SNPs across these probes and uh, genomic scaffolds. Um, and then these were, uh, we were genotyping here, uh, 1,500, about 1,500 uh, model training trees for genomic selection, uh, 3,000 target assessment trees, so to apply genomic selection, and um, about 100 parent and other trees from uh, proof of concepts, pilot studies, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then we also had 190 selfing line trees. So it is about 30 different complete selfing lines from S1 to S5. Um, and this was just my, my personal project. I kind of wanted to sh shove in there because I, I, I had had this data from John and I, I really wanted to just look further into the selfing data. Um, and that's um, work that was done uh, that, that was actually a lot more work than we thought it was going to be, and I'll touch on that in a second, but uh, we did that with the hard work of uh, folks at uh, Rapid Genomics in Florida, so uh, Landra Nevis and, and Jesse Breinhold. Um, so why was that a lot of work? Well, remember I mentioned these uh, 100 or so uh, parent trees, trees from different geographic origins, essentially. They uh, came from all across the range of the species. And uh, it took us about two years to get those SNPs, um, the reason being we had a very large proportion of monomorphic loci. So this was kind of our first clue that we really had kind of an issue with diversity in the species. We're just really not seeing across these few thousand trees that we're genotyping any polymorphisms. Um, and so we really had to fine tune our approach to uh, genotyping, eventually getting the amount of, uh, of SNPs that, that I had uh, alluded to before. Um, in a study of the diversity uh, of the, these population at the nucleotide level, we find really that the uh, nucleotide diversity, or what we call pi, is comparable to populations with a, a much reduced uh, size and range. Uh, this is corroborated by you know, population structure results, uh, principal component analysis, where we do see some latitudinal uh, variation, but of course the, uh, the 
the uh, percent of variation that's explained by each principal component in this, um, uh, these basically genetic difference, genetic differentiation is, is so low that it's, it's really non-significant. Uh, so in this analysis, this is kind of a, a demographic analysis of um, change in population, effective population size, any. So we've heard a lot about any uh, uh, in the, these talks uh, the last few days. Um, that we have this kind of decline that is consistent with, uh, with a, some population bottlenecks during the last glacial period. And uh, currently a, an effective population size of you know, around 270 uh, across the range of the species. Uh, so you know, we're talking about diversity and how uh, important uh, effective population size is. Um, yeah, very low effective population size considering the actual census size of, uh, of this species. Uh, so back to the selfing lines now. Um, we had these, of course, uh, genotyped as well. Um, when I kind of compared across the lines, sort of this uh, decline in heterozygosity over time, uh, we do see that in general, yeah, you do have this uh, very steep decline in heterozygosity, which was expected. But there are all these SNPs uh, that really don't, don't fix, which is unexpected. And I know a lot of people can say paralogs. A lot of people say that, yeah, we went, we went through this a lot. Uh, this, um, this paper was actually uh, about a year and nine months in review. Um, but, you know, we re refined it, and it really comes out to, yeah, you have a lot of these uh, SNPs, a uh, few thousand, that just don't fix. And um, really what we're seeing is, you know, heterozygosity generally declining slower than expected, inbreeding coefficient increasing slower than expected, um, possibly balancing selection that might be driving western red cedar's ability to adapt and respond to selection despite this low genetic diversity. So not purging anything, but it does have, you know, some adaptation to, um, to with, withstanding fitness impacts from, uh, from, you know, this extreme inbreeding. So finally, uh, looking at trade improvement, so generally uh, on, in Western Cedar, especially on the coast, um, we're looking at growth, uh, deer browse, big problem for plantations, um, and in, in terms of deer browse, we're looking at foliar chemistry uh, as sort of a, a resilience trait, and heartwood rot, um, which uh, we're looking at wood chemistry as a resilience trait. Um, of course, there's a few other uh, uh, traits that we're looking at, but these are kind of the major ones. And um, heartwood rot, which is a very late express trait, because of course we, we really only see this in the trees once they're kind of being harvested, which is, is a little too late, right? Um, and so we have all these uh, terpenes and also lignans that we're trying to select for um, and, and also better understand so that we can be um, putting, this, uh, putting in trees that are likely to resist this kind of uh, devastating uh, attacks. So in terms of genomic selection in Western Red Cedar, our goals are to determine the genetic architecture of specialized chemistry and growth traits. Uh, so this would be, you know, to, to better inform our uh, model selection and, and what kinds of models we're going to be using to make predictions. Uh, improving breeding value accuracy for polycross mating designs. And then predicting uh, breeding values at the seedling phase for multi-trait early selection. So the study population that we've been using a first generation polycross progeny trial. Uh, of course, um, I can't, I have to really mention and introduce uh, Dr. John Russell, who was instrumental in kind of putting all this in place, setting up this breeding program, getting everything running. Unfortunately, on passed away in 2018. I know a lot of you probably knew him. Um, and so I just, you know, have to mention him. And this is, you know, none of this would have been possible without him. And so now it's kind of finally come full circle. And so hopefully he would have been proud of kind of what's been achieved here. Uh, so we had 1,000 female parent trees, uh, polycross set with, um, with 21 pollen parents, and we sampled trees that were planted in 2000. So it's just one series within uh, seven different series uh, of polycross trials. Um, so this training population that we have for the models uh, coming from three different sites across uh, Vancouver Island and here on the coast, uh, around 1,500 trees phenotyped for uh, growth, chemistry, and also dendrochronology traits. Uh, and then we have parents, uh, parents for these, uh, this population and the offspring that were uh, all genotyped using the approaches I mentioned before. Um, so I know genome sele genomic selection has been talked about quite a lot uh, in the last, uh, uh, last few talks, so uh, I won't mention it too much, but you know, working together with uh, Dr. Uh, Omnia Gamal-Dien, Alvin Yanchak, uh, and Lise van der Marais, 
Uh, so we're basically uh, phenotyping and genotyping. Um, I won't go into too much detail here because it's been talked about a lot already. Uh, doing the cross validations to, to validate the models. And then um, we also actually have in the target population some phenotypes so we can do validation as well within the target population for foliar chemistry. Um, and then selection and propagation of top families, top trees, and then down the road updating models so that we're you know, ensuring that we're getting the most accurate genetic values and breeding values. Uh, and of course the goal, I mean the general goal is, is to reduce uh, this progeny testing and evaluation phase. I know a lot of people think, oh, you know, they don't so much want to reduce this, right? Because you know, it's nice to go out and see the trees and find that, you know, I love being out with the trees too. And I don't think the goal here is to completely eliminate this, but it is to reduce this for some of these traits that you really don't want to be seeing down the road that oh, all your trees are rotten. Or, you know, I mean, I know for growth it's one thing, but for stuff like that, it's, it's, I think it's going to be pretty important. So reducing the breeding cycle length and then huge re reductions in cost, right, in just lost timber that you're not going to, hopefully not going to see. Um, so looking at the genetic architecture of chemistry and growth traits, uh, these traits are highly polygenic. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I want to, uh, I don't have much time left. But, uh, these traits really have thousands of loci that seem to be controlling them. So what we're finding is that, you know, you can apply these traditional uh, linear mixed models and you're going to get similar approaches to any kind of Bayesian approaches or, or various different approaches for genomic selection. And uh, so, yeah, the results. We find that, you know, uh, you get quite an improved, um, you get very high, uh, breeding value, prediction accuracies, um, just in any kind of, in a cross-validation scenario. Um, but most importantly, what we're seeing is where we have um, this scenario of redu uh, completely removing relatedness. So with leave one out cross-validation, we're still seeing very high uh, prediction accuracies for our breeding values uh, for height, uh, foliar monoterpenes, and uh, total extractives or wood lignans and, and, and chemistry. So we expect the predictive accuracy to be zero. This is typically an issue with genomic selection. You know, you have these um, uh, high LD, uh, very low LD in conifers. And so with low linkage to equilibrium, you expect that this is going to be reduced to zero. But uh, we had actually found previously that, of course, linkage to equilibrium, linkage to equilibrium in western red cedar decays quite slowly. And so uh, this really confirmed our results here and uh, we can actually make selections in completely unrelated families just because of this high LD. Uh, and finally, optimal selection for genetic gain. So we have now 119 uh, seedlings that we can select uh, to maximize gain while constraining genetic diversity. So again, uh, just to summarize, uh, backward selection to increase selection intensity, but also forward selection to uh, in improve genetic gain and, and accuracy, capturing LD, and then we're now just we basically have done the multi-trait selection to reduce the breeding cycle length and also increase genetic gain in our seedlings. And hopefully we can, these can be put out uh, to trial soon. So currently just working on genomic selection for foliar disease and browse resistance, uh, drought tolerance, big one. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, reference SNP set for uh, breeding, the breeding program. So reducing the number of SNPs that we have so that we can actually uh, you know, genotype more for less money. Um, and finally, updating the Western Red Cedar reference genome, so trying to get that to a, a chromosome scale assembly. So, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone who's been involved over the last uh, few years, people from all over the place, um, and our funders, um, and, and thank John, of course, who's, without this, this wouldn't have been possible. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, <clears throat> yesterday when we were at Kalamaka, there seemed to be some reluctance on behalf of the government to adopt genomic selection. So this is a commercial species, it is being planted, and is there going to be a, you know, an uptick in at least GS use for this species, do you think? Well. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I, I hope in the case of just Western Red Cedar. I can't speak to other species because I know Western Red Cedar is kind of a special beast. And um, just because of its, you know, short generation times, uh, you know, really easy to propagate it. I'm hoping that at least for some of these traits, like the chemistry traits, that we could be uh, selecting those seedlings and putting them in. Um, I can't speak too much for other traits, but I think it needs to work together, you know, with, with the traditional approaches. I, I, I think there is a place for it. Yeah. 
Hi, Tal. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, just to speak to what Barb was saying, well, first of all, thank you very much because I've actually stolen all of your guys' Heartwood Rock selections and we'll be testing those in the interior. Um, the only concern is with genomic selection, the models were developed for the coast and so with Jeep IE, we just don't know um, if, if I can use basically any of that for what's being deployed into the interior. So that's still a big question and a technical issue that someone else can address maybe, but, um, but yeah, thanks for the material. <laughs> Yeah, that's a potential issue too, right? I mean, we have the interior and the coastal populations, and we know that there isn't a ton of local adaptation, but there is some, and so um, and so we do expect that there might there might be some differences. Uh, we'll see when we get to there. <laughs> do you have any potential explanations for how a uh, cedar is? a species with such a wide range with exhibited heritable variation and growth despite having remarkably little, uh, you know, nucleotide diversity? Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely something we've been wrestling with for, for quite a while. Um, you know, it again, there's been a lot of uh, debate over whether it came from one glacial refugium, whether it came from several glacial refugia, work from uh, Lisa O'Connell with microsatellites, and then go even further back, work with isozymes, do point to one glacial refugium, and I think that the way our, our SNP data also points towards one glacial refugium, although I would have liked to have more data points from the southern part and the interior part of the range. Um, so that's maybe future work. Uh, but yeah, to your question, I really think that uh, there, there is some sort of selection there to maintain some sort of, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, look, I'm hesitant to say balancing selection. I know I mentioned in my talk, and a lot of population geneticists are kind of on the fence about balancing selection, um, but there is something going on there when you're selfing these trees. So these trees that we're selfing, they start from, you know, totally unrelated parents that are crossed, and then five generations of complete selfing. And, and yet there are still lots of loci that are not going to fixation, and that's just not what you expect to see. You expect to see pretty much everything going to fixation. Um, so, you know, you have, after all the filtering and all that, you have like, say, 20,000 loci, and then maybe 2,000 or so, like maybe five, five to 10% of those loci are still completely heterozygous in almost, like, between 20 and 30 lines, right? So that's an average of all the lines. So something there, I think, is what might ex help explain some of that uh, ability to adapt um, despite having really low genetic variation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid that we don't have time. We have yeah. to move to the next session. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So I'd like to introduce our second and final keynote speaker. This is Jeffrey Ross Ibarra, and he is an evolutionary geneticist at the University of California, Davis, with a background in ethnobotany and population genetics. His group works on plant evolution using maize and its wild relatives as a model system to investigate questions from genomic architecture to local adaptation and experimental evolution. Uh, recent work from the group ranges from studying non-equilibrium dynamics of background selection on genetic diversity to methods to detect selection on transposable elements and the role of gene flow in local adaptation and convergent evolution. Um, so we're excited to hear about your impressive work in this system. Uh, so please welcome uh, Jeffrey. Great. Well, um, let's see. Do I need to? Oh, great. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. It's been fun uh, listening to a lot of the science over the past few days and being out in the field and seeing my first provenance trial for something that's not an annual grass. Uh, as you can tell from the slide I'm, and the introduction, I'm not a forest geneticist. I actually have done work on uh, loblolly pine genetics um, something like 15 years ago, uh, but I thought I'd talk about something more recent that <laughs> my lab has done since starting at Davis. Um, we, as evolutionary biologists, we spend a lot of time thinking about genetic diversity, um, its function, how it got there, um, how it's patterned across populations. Whoops. Um, and uh, there we go. 
Um, and what I'll talk about today is work from the last uh, couple years from my lab, thinking about the source of some of that genetic diversity in maize um, and its function, and in the process, uh, what we believe is um, a novel model for the origin of modern maize, which we're pretty excited about. Um, when most of us think about maize, you may think of a field like this, a, a sort of homogeneous uh, manicured maize field in, like agricultural, in industrial agricultural settings. And although I would never admit this in front of my maize colleagues, I'm happy to confide in this audience that this is really boring. Um, and I don't find this particularly interesting. Every individual in this population is genetically identical. They're all hybrid genotypes from a very narrow germplasm base. And so from the perspective of evolutionary biology, these are kind of boring. Um, but over the last 10,000 years, actually, maize has almost exclusively been cultivated in populations like this, where every individual in this population is outcrossing. Outcrossing rate is 97%. Every individual here is genetically distinct. Farmers will trade seed, exchange seed, experiment seed. And, and although we don't think of this as a modern maize field, still today there are millions and millions of hectares of maize grown this way and tens of billions of maize individuals. And it's that farming system that has generated the really impressive and enormous amount of diversity that's, that's present in maize. I first became interested in maize um, in graduate work in ethnobotany because of the sort of phenomenal phenotypic diversity in maize. Um, its uses by different indigenous groups, um, the, the morphology, uh, the color, all of the sort of amazing phenotypic diversity, and I'm not showing here plenty of diversity in stems that you can find maize plants that are a foot tall, and we have maize varieties that grow to 25 feet tall. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of morphological diversity, and not surprisingly, that underlying that morphological diversity is lots of genetic diversity. Um, this is my favorite way of demonstrating that genetic diversity. This is um, fluorescent in situ hybridization. So each row here is a single individual, the 20 chromosomes of maize. And um, the different colors represent fluorescent in situ hybridization of different repeats, kind of genomic repeats across the genome. And the sort of rainbow you see is a nice visual demonstration of variation in genetic uh, content or genetic diversity you know, among chromosomes within an individual, uh, along the genome of a single individual, and among individuals in a population. There's just a tremendous amount uh, of genetic diversity, which as an evolutionary biologist is really exciting. To maybe put hard numbers on this, if we compared the genome of any two people in this room, we would differ at about three million SNPs or three million mutations. If we compare the average human to a chimpanzee, those differ at about 30 million SNPs. And although the maize genome is smaller than the human genome, if we compare these two boring inbred lines of maize, um, they differ at 60 million mutations. So 60 million base pairs differ in those genomes. The maize genome is only about two gigabases, um, but they, it has tremendous diversity. Um, another way to think about it is the per base pair nucleotide diversity in maize is about an order of magnitude higher than it is in dug fir. So it's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity. And it's that genetic diversity which has allowed maize to adapt um, to uh, just a huge range of environments. As you'll see um, throughout in other parts of the talk, maize was domesticated in Mexico, but after domestication spread across the Americas and has now colonized the entire planet, basically. Uh, everywhere uh, there's soil, you can grow maize. Uh, of all of the major crops, maize has a broader geographic breadth than any of the other major crops, and is adapted to a huge range of conditions from the, the tropics up to almost close to the Arctic Circle. I have a colleague currently growing maize in Helsinki, for example. Maize has adapted to even environments where you think you shouldn't be growing maize. So this is a traditional Hopi maize field in the Mojave Desert in the southwest US grown in rain-fed conditions, and maize is perfectly happy here, at least some varieties that are locally adapted are perfectly happy here. But you can find maize uh, in, this is a, a traditional population, a traditional variety of maize grown at 4,000 meters in the Andes. And maize can be found in the Himalayas, maize can be found in very wet conditions, and maize can be found in the desert. It is adapted to all of these different conditions. Um, so maize is tremendously diverse, and this diversity is exciting, but has also proved confusing or difficult for understanding the origins of maize. Not only is maize, uh, is there lots of polymorphism within maize, but if we compare maize to other grasses, maize looks pretty weird, right? It's not a sort of normal looking grass. When you imagine a grass, you, I think most of us think of something like this. Maize is a, just a very different beast, and it's this morphological difference between maize and other grasses that led to more than 100 years of confusion about the origins of maize. 
Indeed, by the, you know, even by the middle of the 20th century, prominent botanists like Edgar Anderson still weren't quite sure what continent maize was from. Maize is different not only from other grasses, but what we know now is its, most, uh, its closest wild relative, Teosinte. So Teosinte is just a, a generic term for the wild relatives of maize. So maize here on the right tends to have a single stalk. Teosinte looks much more grass-like, has lots of basal tillers and lateral branches. If we sort of zoom in, um, those lateral branches in maize are highly shortened and end in a female inflorescence, which is the ear that we, that we all know and, and make use of. In Teosinte, it's a little hard to see here, but the branches are much longer and the, the lateral branches end in a male inflorescence. So we have different uh, sexes of the, of the lateral inflorescences in maize and Teosinte. Most prominently, of course, the differences in the ear. Um, these are to the same scale. This is an ear of sweet corn. Uh, modern maize can have 500, even 1,000 kernels per ear. This is, uh, to scale, an ear of Teosinte. And if we sort of zoom in on that, you can see that um, there are only maybe five to 12 kernels uh, in, in a single ear. I'm showing this as a green ear here because when this ear matures, they actually disarticulate and fall to the ground. So not only are there a few kernels, but there's no cob. Um, and these aren't actually kernels, this is a fruit case. So upon maturity, those structures become brown or black, different colors, and hard. So it's a very hard structure surrounding the kernel such that you can even break your tooth on this. And to find the kernel, you'd have to go inside the, that fruit case. And so this, is, this kernel here is what's compared, comparable to the exposed kernels on modern maize. So just really dramatic differences um, that have built up in, in only a few thousand, maybe 10,000 years. And these differences are what led to all of this uh, confusion on the origins of maize. Um, adding to this confusion, the archaeological record didn't help things, that there was quite a bit of evidence in the archaeological record for what appeared to be hybridization between maize and some other grass. So by looking at cobs um, from different archaeological deposits over time, archaeologists were able to show that um, we had some ancient maize, and sometime thousands of years after initial domestication, we have what appeared to be hybridization with some other grass, leading to increased size um, and differences in morphology. Um, and some went so far as to, to make really wide crosses with embryo rescue to other grasses to show that they could reconstitute cobs that looked like these in the archaeological record. This data is what, or these archaeological findings were what gave rise to what was the most common model of maize origins for most of the 20th century. And in retrospect, it, it seems almost sort of a, a silly model. The idea is referred to as the tripartite hypothesis. The idea was that some unknown perennial grass that nobody ever identified hybridized with an extinct maize that no longer exists and nobody ever identified. And that magical hybrid um, gave rise to both now extant populations of wild Teosinte and modern maize. Um, and maybe as silly as this sounds in retrospect, this was the predominant model for most of the 20th century. What we um, now know is the more accepted model of maize uh, uh, origins um, comes from George Beadle. Uh, George Beadle did his PhD in maize genetics, and then sadly he uh, wasted most of his career staring at fungi and fruit flies, something something Nobel Prize, um, and uh, fortunately on retirement, he saw the light um, and stopped working on fruit flies and neurospora and came back to working on maize genetics in his retirement. And in his retirement, through a series of really impressive amounts of crosses, F2 populations with tens of thousands of individuals, um, and, uh, oops, uh, and the popping Teosinte, uh, he came to the conclusion that maize was actually most closely related to and came from, originated from its closest wild relative Teosinte. So here's karyotype data showing that in hybrids, you can clearly distinguish the chromosomes of maize and other perennial, other grasses like trypsicum. They don't hybridize, they don't line up in meiosis, suggesting that ruling out some of these other grasses as possible uh, ancestors. And so uh, Beetle's model is a very simple one that modern maize and Teosinte both derive from a common ancestor that looks probably very much like what extant Teosinte looks like today. So I've been um, saying Teosinte to refer to the, the wild relatives of maize. There are a number of them. They exist, uh, they, they occur all throughout Mesoamerica, only in North America. There are no Teosintes in, in South America. Um, but the Teosintes are a diverse group of taxa 
with a diverse group of adaptations and phenotypes. There are polyploid teosinte, there are perennial teosinte, there are teosinte that can grow clonally. There are some that have adapted to waterlogged swamps and others that have adapted to arid high elevation conditions. So they're a really diverse group of grasses with a, a number of exciting adaptations. The ones that we'll focus on here and are the two teosintes that I uh, referred to in my talk title um, are these two widespread annual grasses, ZMA subspecies, subspecies parvoglumus, um, that I'll refer to as parvoglumus and use this red or this icon here. And this grows in the tropical lowlands of southwest Mexico. And you can find it, all of this grass here is teosinte in this picture. It grows in large populations of millions of individuals on, on hillsides, and you can still go out and collect this today. Um, and ZMA subspecies mexicana, which grows in the high elevations of the central plateau of Mexico uh, at elevations above 1,800 meters and up to almost 3,000 meters. And this is adapted to the colder, arid conditions of the central plateau with a number of phenotypic adaptations and um, phenolo phenological changes and physiological changes. And it occurs mostly in small, weedy populations uh, in, in, um, in disturbed areas. This is a Mexicana in Norman Borlaug's wheat field uh, showing who's boss. Um, I, I should back up. These two, um, for perspective, these two are actually quite distinct from each other genetically. Um, so they diverged something like 30,000 generations ago, which to, in perspective is about the similar generation time difference between humans and Neanderthals. Um, FST is like 0.15 between these two. So they're very, they're pretty diverged, taxa easily recognizable phenotypically. Um, in about two, in the early 2000s, John Dobley at the University of Wisconsin tried to sort out, went, set about sorting out which of these teosintes was the, the real ancestor of modern maize. And using uh, several hundred microsatellites, he built phylogenetic trees like the one I'm showing here, and showed that by and large, um, all of maize nested cleanly within this taxa parvoglumus. And he came to the conclusion that the closest wild relative of, parvoglum of modern maize was parvoglumus, and this was the, the, the best candidate for the ancestor of modern maize. And this really has been the predominant model of maize origin for the past 20 years or so. And this really is where my lab's work uh, comes in, because in our studies looking at adaptation um, of maize across the Americas, over the past 10 years, we kept finding increasing evidence of contribution from the second highland teosinte to maize populations. So for example, first looking at maize in the highlands of central uh, Mexico, where maize grows right alongside teosinte. You can find F1 hybrids. They, hybrid, they hybridize frequently. Farmers will even intentionally hybridize them. And we've been able to show um, that gene flow or admixture from Mexicana into maize allowed maize to adapt to the highlands of Mexico. And you can see really nice convergent evolution at the phenotypic level of highland maize and this highland teosinte. So a, a substantial contribution of this teosinte to adaptation, at least in the, the highlands of central Mexico. A number of years ago, looking at ancient DNA from a cave dwelling in the southwest US, we were able to show that maize first made it into the southwest, into the US 4,000 years ago, coming up the central plateau of Mexico and bringing with it alleles from this second highland teosinte. So the earliest maize in the US also had some alleles from, from this other teosinte. And then most recently, um, thinking of, we've been thinking about uh, convergent adaptation to high elevation environments and looking at maize in the Andes. We use population genetic approaches to identify alleles that show evidence of selection in high elevation populations, compared those between Mexico and the Andes, and find a number of loci in the genome where the same allele shows evidence of selection in both Mexico and the Andes. And in many of those cases, that allele has moved via gene flow from Mexico all the way to the Andes, even though there's no teosinte anywhere in the Andes or historically. So all of these data, um, sorry, we can even, we've even found individual loci that we can pinpoint that have moved from Mexicana into maize and contributed adaptation. So from a couple years ago, um, this, we used population genetic models to look at allele frequencies across elevation in Mexico, find a candidate region that shows evidence of selection in this region along the chromosome. It overlaps with the QTL for hair, uh, um, hair abundance on stem, this really dramatic Phenotype is, is a typical adaptation to highland maize um, in both in Mexico and in South America. You get these dense macro hairs and dark stem pig pigmentation that are adaptations to the cold. Um, this population genetic signal overlaps a QTL. 
when we look at genome assemblies of both highland maize and lowland maize, we can find an inversion polymorphism that perfectly overlaps with our POPGEN signal. There's exactly one gene in that inversion, and that gene is a known uh, maize candidate, macro hairless one, that you knock out this gene, you lose uh, epidermal macro hairs. We can show that this gene comes from the highland teosinte. So we have all of this evidence that at least in, in these highland populations in the southwest and the Andes um, and in Mexico, we have contributions of this second teosinte. And so we began wondering a couple years ago, well, could it be that this second teosinte has contributed more broadly to maize evolution? But what we really didn't have the resources to, to do anything with this because there weren't good resources for the teosintes. In spite of how cool they are, there just hadn't been much, many genomic resources developed for these. So in collaboration with um, folks at Waozhong Agricultural University in a series of projects led by my postdoc, um, Ning Yang, who's now a professor at Waozhong Agricultural University, we set about just creating genomic resources so we could start asking these questions. Um, we collected uh, from germplasm repositories and colleagues and everywhere we could get our hands on um, hundreds of samples of wild teosinte from all of the taxa in the genus. Uh, hundreds of traditional varieties from all across Mesoamerica, and more than 500 inbred uh, maize lines. And we sequenced all of these, the entire genome to high depth, called SNPs, et cetera, um, giving us a, a pretty uh, good data set of something like 40 million SNPs across uh, about 1,000 different maize genomes. And then with this really impressive data set, we did something really dumb. Um, because it was easy to do. And we said, well, if the, the traditional model or the, the existing model of maize origins um, is right, then we should get a tree like this, where maize and parvoglumus are sister taxa. Um, and we can test whether or not this tree is right. We can calculate a statistic called F4. F4 is just a measure of the covariance of allele frequencies along a phylogeny. And if F4 is zero um, under this tree, that says that this tree is right. If F4 is negative, that means there's gene flow between the two teosinte taxa here. And if F4 is positive, that suggests admixture or gene flow from Mexicana, this highland teosinte, into modern maize. In the three populations I've already told you about, in maize in the Andes, in southwest US, and in the highlands of Mexico, we see positive values of F4, strong evidence for admixture between this highland teosinte, between Mexicana and maize, consistent with what, what we'd already seen. If we look across our more than 250 genomes across all of Mesoamerica, every single one of those traditional varieties of maize across Mesoamerica also shows evidence of gene flow from uh, Mexicana. If we look at traditional varieties in China that got there soon after European contact and have, as far as we know, never had any contact with teosinte, all of those show evidence of, of admixture as well. And when we sequence more than 500 modern inbreds that represent all of the sort of breeding pools of modern maize germplasm, all of those also show positive values of F4, suggesting that in all maize everywhere, we see admixture from the second teosinte contributing to the maize genome. We expanded this using GBS, or genotyping by sequencing data, for a few hundred thousand SNPs for a beautiful collection of uh, maize samples by the International Maize and Weed Improvement Center in Mexico City, who collected more than 5,000 traditional varieties across Mesoamerica. Again, in every single one of those samples, we see evidence of admixture from this uh, other teosinte, and we see that admixture varies in interesting ways across the landscape. And indeed, if you, do, if you just take the genomic data and you do a principal component analysis of all the genotype diversity, and you look at PC1 of, that, uh, of, the, of the data, so the principal component that explains the axis that explains most of the variation in the genetic diversity, that axis is essentially perfectly correlated with Mexicana, with admixture with the second teosinte saying that this variation across the landscape, not only does everybody have Mexicana admixture, but variation in that admixture is the primary axis or the primary factor in, in patterning maize diversity of traditional maize varieties across uh, the Americas. We then wondered, well, okay, we see ubiquitous admixture. How did it get there and what kind of model, you know, what, what's sort of the, the history of this? And to do this, we needed to do something more than just calculate sort of genome-wide estimates of admixture. So we set out using a hidden Markov model, a very simple approach that basically trundles along the genome one SNP at a time and asks for each SNP, do we see evidence in this particular genome that it uh, has ancestry from Mexicana or it has ancestry from Parvoglumus? And we do this across um, each chromosome of every genome for all of our several thousand genomes and get something like this cartoon here where we have tracts of admixture and we can say this chunk of the, cream, the chromosome was inherited from Mexicana and these other chunks don't show evidence of admixture. 
we can then take those chunks and ask things about evolutionary history based on the size and distribution of those chunks. Because in an F1, of course, half the genome will be from uh, one of the parents. As uh, time passes, recombination will break that down. And so the size and distribution of those tracts of introgression or admixture tell you something about the timing of, of admixture. And so we do this uh, across all of our data. Um, what our actual data looks like is something like this. So this is the probability of Mexicana ancestry across one chromosome of maize. Um, and you can see that on average it's fairly low, but we see these small regions of, these are our tracts of Mexicana integration that are fairly small regions. On average, most of these blocks of admixture are on the order of about 10 kb or smaller, suggesting that, it's really, that admixture was really old. And indeed, when we estimate this using a couple different population genetic approaches, we get something on the order of about 6,000 years ago. So we think that the admixture event that gave rise to this, to the existing variation in ancestry happened about 6,000 years ago. And this really nicely uh, ties in with the archaeological record, where the earliest archaeological evidence of maize in the highlands of central Mexico was 6,200 years ago. So our genetic data suggests soon after maize actually moved into the highlands uh, from uh, initial domestication in the lowlands, it admixed with, with uh, this teosinte, and that gave rise to the existing variation that we see in modern maize. Confirming this, we can look at um, ancient genomes from across the Americas. So if we look at ancient genomes from South America, a number of genomes from 200 to 1,000 years old, all of these ancient genomes, again, show evidence of admixture. So that Mexicana diversity or, or admixture was already in South America 1,000 years ago. The oldest uh, cob collected in Mesoamerica, or um, in, in Mexico, about 5,000 years old, shows strong evidence of admixture with Mexicana. Across the now, I think, almost 2,500 genomes we've looked at, the only genome that shows no evidence of admixture with Mexicana is this really beautiful sample called N16, which collaborators collected um, uh, 10 years ago on the, in an archaeological site on the coast of Peru. And the thing that's exciting about N16, we can't, if we look at our F4 statistics, the confidence interval here overlaps zero, and we can't reject a model of no admixture. And that's exciting because we actually don't expect to see any here. This cob is old enough. It's, it was in Peru 5,500 years ago, right about the same time that maize first came into contact with Mexicana in Mexico. So this lineage had been in Peru or had been in South America thousands of years before there was any possibility of gene flow with Mexicana. And there is no Teosinte in South America currently. So there's no way, if everything works, uh, if, 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 there's no way that this should have been able to have any contact or admixture with Mexicana. And it's the only sample we have where we don't see any genetic evidence of that. So putting all these pieces together, we have what we think is a novel model of maize origins. Um, we think maize, consistent with archaeological and other data, maize was domesticated in the tropical lowlands of southwest Mexico. And from there, it quickly spread across the Americas. And we have good archaeological evidence of, of that spread. And we know it made it down into, as far as into South America by six or 7,000 years ago. Um, and this is consistent with the early microsat data and the cytological data suggesting that the teosinte that's closest to modern maize is indeed this teosinte from the lowlands, Parvaglumus. But we think after maize made it to the highlands of the central Mexico uh, and hybridized with Mexicana, it then spread back out of the highlands, replacing maize everywhere across the Americas. And this is consistent with both our admixture data and that earlier archaeological data I mentioned that shows evidence of admixture in the archaeological record. Intriguingly, that, if you remember, that ad evidence of admixture in the archaeological record um, was associated with larger cobs. And this got us thinking about the timing of this with relation to uh, human civilizations and the potential uh, function of this admixture in maize. So if we put this in sort of a broader archaeological perspective, we know from microfossils that maize was domesticated about 9,000 years ago in, this, in the southwest lowlands of Mexico. Our genetic data suggests that admixture happened about 5,500 years ago. But we can layer onto that a lot more archaeological data, including C14 isotope data. And this is really cool. This is isotope data from human bones from archaeological remains. And because maize is a C4 plant, you can use C14 ratios in, um, yeah, you, you can use isotope ratios in human bones to determine what proportion of their diet uh, was maize. And we see that soon after this admixture and maize spreading out of the highlands, we have transitioned to a, a diet that has increasing uh, amount of maize in human diet, and then maize becoming a staple part of human diets. 
soon after that, first agricultural villages and first regional civilizations. So maize became a staple all across Mesoamerica at about the same time, about 4,000 years ago. And while we can't you know, uh, perfectly connect this admixture with uh, the origin of maize as a staple, it's, um, it's suggestive that perhaps this admixture may have played a role in maize becoming the staple crop that it is in the Americas. But this is nice, but it suggests that you know, this admixture must be doing something. And so we'd like to know what are the, the sort of functional consequences of this admixture in maize. And I don't have final answers for that, but I can, uh, I'll show you in the last part of the talk here um, some sort of pieces of that puzzle. So one of the first things we looked at, we know that if you cross maize with teosinte, you get hybrid vigor. This is traditional maize varieties in the, in the foreground, and this is a maize Mexicana F1 in the background. So they're ginormous, happy plants that produce tons of, of kernels. And we thought perhaps uh, Mexicana alleles um, were just a slightly better on average, and they had fewer deleterious alleles. We know that the process of domestication leads to a buildup of deleterious alleles and genetic load. And we thought maybe some of the gene flow was just providing generalized hybrid vigor. And we can use phylogenetic approaches to identify deleterious alleles in individual maize genomes, and then calculate what percentage or where are those deleterious alleles, and do they associate with regions of admixture or not? And indeed, the regions of the maize genome that come from uh, Mexicana, on average, have much lower proportion of deleterious alleles than the regions that, that weren't intergressed, suggesting that these alleles may have been beneficial. This still isn't super satisfying because it doesn't connect us to phenotype in any way that we'd like. And so the next thing we did is start setting about identifying individual loci. And we used a population genetic approach um, because my first response to everything is sequence it and look at allele frequencies. We can calculate admixture proportions, which is that in internal ring here. But then we can identify regions of the genome that have an excess of Mexicana alleles across many, many samples. So essentially, where most maize, allele, ma maize individuals have a Mexicana allele that are at a very high frequency, suggesting selection. We can zero in on those, on those regions. Oops. Um, yeah, there we go. So this is one such region on chromosome 7. This is our probability of, May of Mexicana ancestry. And you can see we get these really small admixture tracts. This is one block of admixture that has exactly one gene in it. That allele came from Mexicana and is now at 80% frequency in maize. We can ask then, what is that gene doing? One of the great things about working on maize is all of the genomic resources available for maize. We know that this uh, gene is probably involved in circadian rhythm. Um, in, in determining, uh, in uh, flowering from uh, day length. With collaborators at Waozhong Agriculture University, we knocked out this gene with CRISPR. The knockout, if we grow this maize in long day conditions, the knockout flowers much earlier than the wild type. If we overexpress the gene in long day conditions, we get delayed flowering. So this hasn't quite yet uh, started to flower, and this is already making a tassel. If we look at it in short day conditions, we see no impact whatsoever, consistent with its role in determining, in, 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 in interpreting photo period um, and not just general flowering time. And if we look at gene expression of this locus in uh, the lowland tropical parvoglumus and modern maize, which has the highland Mexicana allele, we see lower expression in modern maize, consistent with uh, our knockout leading to earlier flowering. We think that the Mexicana allele has allowed maize to flower earlier and adapt to higher latitudes as it spreads out of the tropics into higher latitudes in both North America and South America. This locus may have been important in allowing maize to adapt to these different photoperiod conditions. In addition to using sort of strict population genetic approaches to identify uh, um, loci, we can also take association mapping approaches. And here, instead of associating phenotype with SNP genotype and your nucleotide at a particular site, we associate SNP genotype with uh, ancestry at a particular SNP. And so we can, uh, for every individual, we can genotype its ancestry at a particular SNP and then do correlations between the ancestry and phenotypes of interest. We've done this now for many different uh, traits in many different populations, and I'll show just a, a couple of these exciting uh, results in a, re in a population of 500 modern inbreds that have been we phenotyped for a number of traits. We see, for example, a really strong hit of association with, with kernel oil content. So the Mexicana allele increases kernel oil content. And in fact, the Mexicana allele can be found in some modern maize breeding lines that have been bred for high oil content. But intriguingly, um, this locus is also probably important for cold adaptation and may be uh, uh, key for freezing adaptation. And it's been shown that overexpression in Arabidopsis, for example, confers tolerance to freezing, uh, freezing conditions. 
we found looking at traditional varieties in a really beautiful set of common gardens that um, uh, International Maize and Wheat Center uh, has built, looking at phenotypes in more than 23 common gardens. The strongest association we see with any phenotype and anything anybody has looked at is this really tight peak um, of cob diameter or cob size with an unknown gene, ZM something something. Um, we still don't know much about this gene and would like to do more with it, but it's intriguing because not, uh, not only is this an important phenotype, but it also tracks with what we'd seen in the archaeological record of increased Mexicana ancestry being associated with an increase in cob size and potentially uh, uh, maize becoming a, a, a staple crop. And then um, just yesterday, as I was uh, finishing up the talk, colleagues um, from Purdue sent me this plot. They've been using the same approach, looking at Mexicana ancestry association in a panel of 280 diverse inbreds to try to understand drought uh, in maize. And so they're comparing ionomic data and the content of different ions in maize inbreds in both drought and well-watered conditions. And they find this in a nice peak that shows up only in drought conditions for an ORDML protein, which is involved in in subrin and um, membrane development in maize roots, and is strongly associated with calcium and magnesium ion uptake in drought conditions. Um, so we got this result yesterday. We still don't know a, a ton about it, but it suggests that for a number of different phenotypes in lots of different panels, including modern maize uh, lines that are used for breeding, variation in Mexicana ancestry is associated with phenotypes that we might care about. And then finally, um, we said, well, let's take a big step back. And rather than doing a sort of locus by locus association, can we just ask how much of the additive genetic variance for phenotype is explained by this variation in, in Mexicana ancestry? And so we build a relatively simple uh, linear model. It's basically an extension of the animal model. And we build kinship matrices for genome-wide SNPs and kinship matrices based on shared ancestry and ask what proportion of the phenotypic or, or the additive genetic variation for phenotypes is explained by these different matrices and are competing those in the model. And we do this for, uh, I think there's 35 different phenotypes across a broad panel of uh, uh, inbred lines. And we can see that for many different phenotypes, a substantial portion of the additive genetic variance comes from variation in Mexicana ancestry among these samples. So for example, uh, kernel number, the number of kernels per row, nearly a quarter of the additive genetic variance is due to variation in Mexicana ancestry in this Highland to Yucinte ancestry. For biochemical traits like lignoceric acid, we get a uh, not insubstantial proportion of additive genetic variance. And then for some traits like some disease resistance traits, as much as half of the additive genetic variance comes from not necessarily the, the SNP genotype at our SNPs that we've genotyped um, in this panel, but whether or not that haplotype comes from Mexicana or this lowland teosinte. So we think that although we, we don't sort of have a smoking gun as to why this Mexicana ancestry was selected for or made maize a staple crop, we have lots of evidence that this, that, the, that this variation is functional and relates to phenotypes that we might care about, including things like cob diameter and flowering time that could have contributed to maize becoming uh, an important staple. Okay, I will end there. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that our population genetic evidence suggests strongly that all maize everywhere in, in the Americas um, shows evidence of admixture between these two teosintes, that that suggests um, a novel model of maize origins that after domestication, thousands of years after domestication, after maize had already made it into the Americas, we had an admixture event that then replaced maize across the Americas and may have given rise to or been important in maize becoming the staple crop that it is today. And that although we're far from uh, finishing and nailing it down, we certainly have lots of evidence that this ancestry is functional. It's not just neutral, but it's actually doing things that we care about, even relevant for both adaptation across the environment and adaptation for modern breeding. Um, and although I've talked only about admixture in maize, I suspect that as genomic resources for other crops and indeed lots of other plants um, are, are developed, we'll find that admixture with locally adapted populations like uh, Mexi this Mexicano is already locally adapted to highland conditions, that as plants move across the landscape, admixture with locally adapted populations is an important source of adaptive variation. I should, of course, thank uh, collaborators, especially um, Ning and Aaron, who did a, a bunch of the work on the population genetics, um, and uh, collaborators on my NSF grant, and folks uh, at other universities, and uh, lab alumni and funders, um, folks in my lab currently who have had to listen to me give this talk uh, and focus on this work for the last couple of years, um, and 
with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, I think we have about five minutes for questions. Hi, really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you're able to see admixture or differing admixture of the teosintes in like modern groups, like between stiff stocks, stiff stocks, non stiff stocks, or between like early and late flowering lines. Yeah, that's a, um, oh, that's a great question. Um, I haven't looked at it between, say, early and late flowering times. So um, the, there are a number of different heterotic groups in maize that are used for breeding. As you mentioned, the stiff stock and non stiff stock. Um, there aren't major differences between stiff stock and non stiff stock. The area where we see interesting differences in, is in Europe. Um, the main breeding pools are flint and non flint, uh, flint and dent lines. The flint lines in Europe um, historically came from northeast um, uh, US and, and, or southeast Canada, and those in turn actually came from southwest US. Um, Arizona, New Mexico area, and uh, originally up the, the central plateau. And so the northern flint lines in Canada actually carry quite a bit of Mexicana ancestry. And we can find a number of the loci that appear to be um, selected for highland adaptation in Mexico also show up in modern breeding lines uh, in, in Europe. Thanks, Jeffrey. A great talk. Oh, sorry, I'm... Um, Mexico first. <laughs> uh, which is the... Um, archaeological site for the early domestication of the corn. Is it not the cave of Coxcatlan in uh, no. the Huacan Valley? No, Coxcatlan um, has uh, the earliest uh, macro fossils. Um, the earliest archaeological evidence for maize comes from um, a cave in uh, a rock shelter in Guerrero called Shibatoshla. And there are no macro fossils, so there are no cobs there. but. Um, uh, our, our colleagues discovered microfossils, so um, pollen and phytolith evidence in the soil that can be uniquely identified as maize, as well as stone tools that are used for maize grinding. And that evidence is from 8,700 years before present. Great. Um, let me go back to that slide. But um, so, really good correlation or. Um, between the development of maize and the first uh, villages and, and of course, the, some of the most significant empires established in Mesoamerica. Um, are you able to estimate what the calories, the, the increase in calories were going from the, from the, uh, to, the, to the modern maize? And then what would that compare to, how, how is that calorie per, per ear or per kernel compared to the, the maize that, and the corn that we get today? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if you could turn that into, my guess is you could turn that into calories with assumptions about um, necessary caloric intake of peoples. What you get from the carbon isotope data is the proportion of their diet made up of maize. And so you could multiply that by the, the caloric intake. Um, one of the interesting things about maize breeding, you asked about calories of, of sort of ancient maize versus modern. Um, if you look at a teosinte plant or even a maize plant from 200 years ago, they don't make any fewer kernels than your best modern uh, maize line. So there's been no change in the productivity per plant, essentially, over the last 10,000 years. What has changed um, in domestication is concentrating all of those kernels. Instead of having 300 small ears, you have one large ear. And then over the last 100 years of breeding, what has changed is not the productivity per plant, but 100 years ago, we were planting 25,000 plants per hectare, and now we're planting 85,000 plants per hectare and still getting the same per plant productivity. Um, but the, the sort of caloric production per plant actually hasn't changed much. Thanks so much, Jeff. I have a, two linked questions. Um, you've presented your model as there being one hybrid event, but we know plants within a genus frequently hybridized, potentially over thousands or millions of years. So can you explain why you think there was just one event? And if you think it was one event, do you think it was due to climate or due to humans moving uh, maize up into the Mexicana range? Yeah, so great question. Um, the, the first, we actually suspect that there may have been admixture with additional Teosinte taxa, not just the Highland Mexicana, but that as maize spread across the Americas, it probably interagressed with other Teosinte. And so if you know anyone at NSF, tell them to fund our 
project looking into that um, <laughs> because I, I think that that's likely the case. As far as the Mexicana admixture, um, the distribution of track lengths along the genome suggests that it was predominantly a single uh, event. Um, that's a dramatic oversimplification for maize in the highlands where we know gene flow is ongoing today. You can walk out in a field and find F1s or back cross. So we know in the highlands of Mexico where the populations are sympatric, gene flow is ongoing. But for most of these populations, they exist far, far away from the range of Mexicana. And so I think as maize moved out of the highlands, the ability to exchange genes with Mexicana drops to zero. So we think while it wasn't you know, a given Tuesday in one person's backyard, it was predominantly a single admixture event over you know, a few hundred years, and then that uh, admixed maize moved out of the highlands. Um, I think you, did you have a second question that I missed? Oh, um, I, yeah, so was the admixture due to, to climate or to humans? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, definitely humans moved maize into the highlands of, of Mexico. Um, why maize, uh, why the admixture became beneficial, I'm not sure. There's another sort of intriguing piece of archaeological data that I didn't talk about is what's referred to as the 4.2 KB event, K, yeah, KBP event, that there was a um, sort of uh, worldwide drought around 4,200 years ago. Um, and so perhaps that's actually why our colleagues are looking at drought loci and ancestry, that perhaps that drought may be um, initiated or, or made this admixture beneficial. Uh, but yeah, the short answer is we don't, I don't think we have good enough data to say. Okay, and with that, I think I have to cut off questions. Sorry, John. <laughs> um, let's thank Jeffrey again for that fascinating talk. Oh, and then we have a, we have a gift for you. All right, thank you, Jeffrey. So our next speaker is Tom Booker, uh, and he recently joined uh, the UBC Faculty of Forestry as an assistant professor, and he's going to be talking to us about the genetic basis of convergent local adaptation in conifers. I think it might no? not be. Oh. Is that, that better now? Should I put it back on? Is that okay? Yep. Cool. All right, thanks. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, Ah, how do I go back? That's not working. Uh-oh. Uh -huh. That one doesn't go back. There it is. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Beth. Uh, holy moly. Jeff's talk was great. What a hard act to follow. Um, thank you so much to the organizers. This has been such a great uh, conference. I've learned so much over the last couple of days. It's been really, really, really awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so like Beth said, I'm just starting as an assistant professor at UBC. Um, and I thought I would say this at the beginning, because I keep, in my practices, I kept forgetting to say it at the end, but uh, if you're interested in grad school uh, opportunities, I I'm going to be recruiting, and I am recruiting um, uh, grad students. So if you know people who are interested in the kinds of things I'll be talking about today, uh, do uh, get in touch if you're in the audience, or put your, put your people in contact with me if, if, that's, uh, if you think it's a good idea. Um, Right, so this is work that I've done at UBC and partially at University of Calgary over the last five years or so as part of my postdoc. Um, <clears throat> right, so given that I work at UBC, that means I live and work on the traditional unceded and uh, ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Given that most of this work happened while I was working, in, uh, working from home during COVID, I specifically worked on the ancestral uh, territories of the Squamish nation, so just wanted to point that out before I get going. Um, I also wanted to point out before I really launch into things that this is a really, really big collaborative project uh, as part of the co-adaptory project, which is a large project. Many of you have probably interacted with it in some ways, but I really wanted to point out Sally, uh, Sally Aitken specifically because uh, as, one, as the co-PI of this project, she's been a very, very, very great mentor to all of us in the project. Um, and as you can see, there's a large number of people involved in the project. Uh, only a very small number of us are here. But um, yeah, it's a big interdisciplinary, interinstitutional project. It's been a lot of fun. And all the work I'm talking about today, I would certainly not want to give the impression that it's been stuff that I've done by myself. This is collaborative work very much. OK, uh, but particularly, I'd like to highlight the contributions of these four people, Pooja Singh, Jim Whiting, Sam Yeo, and Mike Whitlock. Pooja, Jim, and myself have been working on the empirical side of, 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 the, of this project. Sam and Mike have been my supervisors for the kind of the statistical methods development I'm going to allude to throughout the talk. 
Boop. OK. So this is a picture that many of you will have come across in your, uh, in your undergraduate training. This is a very, very classic cartoon describing the process of uh, local adaptation. So <clears throat> this is a very, very, very classic description of a reciprocal transplant experiment, a uh, common garden experiment, where you have individuals, say, from the northern part of a species range and the southern parts of a species range, and you put them into common gardens in both in, in a reciprocal fashion, and you find that individuals in the north do better uh, in the north, and individuals in the south do better in the south. Okay? This classic cr crossing of reaction norms. This is very characteristic of the process of local adaptation. We've heard a lot about local adaptation in the last few days, um, and this is just a, the very, very classic way of demonstrating it. But as I, it kind of seems a bit silly to tell you all about provenance trials, but uh, uh, provenance trials can also demonstrate local adaptation. Uh, and as Greg was talking about yesterday on the tour, you can, using provenance trial data, you can generate these transfer functions, which are a really, really nice way of demonstrating the, uh, the kind of the spatial extent of local, local adaptation in a species. So this happens to be data from uh, interior spruce. The y-axis is height, x-axis is transfer distance, so how far you're moving. Uh, particular individuals from their home provenances, demonstrating uh, local adaptation in, in spruce. Why I'm talking about local adaptation is because it's really, really important in the natural world. Again, it seems a bit silly and redundant to tell you all that, but uh, that's just the case. Um, uh, Laura was showing us this morning in her talk how many, many species uh, of, of trees based on provenance trials exhibit, uh, th there's evidence for many species of trees uh, that many, tree many species exhibit local adaptation. Um, and in fact, as we, again, as we were talking about yesterday, that local adaptation is the formation, is, forms the basis of policy, reforestation policy, right? Geographic seed transfer or climate-based seed transfer are all informed by local adaptation. Okay, and so here are two species. Let's say we've got the lodgepole pine and we've got the, the white Engelmann interior spruce complex. Um, for the purposes of this, I'll just call the interior spruce, I'll just call it the interior spruce. Uh, so these two species have large ranges. They both live in northern North America. Um, uh, <clears throat> and they share a common ancestor 120 million years ago, right? So it's very, very, very deep time. They've been separated for an awful long time. But they both inhabit rel fairly similar ranges. Certainly there's a large uh, portion of their ranges that overlap. And if you look at genetic, or sorry, um, climatic and kind of environmental variation within their, that portion of overlap, of course, these things overlap because I've chosen to look at portions of the ranges that overlap, so you can see that, oops, um, uh, aspects of the environment, latitude or temperature or um, uh, seasonality uh, kind of overlap in those regions. So for those reasons, and the fact that these, both of these species happen to exhibit quite strong local adaptation, I think it's reasonable to say that both of these, these species exhibit convergent local adaptation. There is local adaptation in both species. Both species have evolved local adaptation to similar environmental challenges, okay? So in 2016, this paper that I'm highlighting at the bottom right of these slides, uh, led by Sam Yeaman and Kay Hodgins, um, <clears throat> asked, if we can identify the genetic basis of local adaptation, do we see, is, is there, are there commonalities in the basis of, genetic, uh, of, of local adaptation in these two species, despite the fact that they've been separated for an awful long time? And they found, uh, quite surprisingly at the time, actually, that there, actually, there, there is. There is there, depending on how you do your analyses, which I'll get into in a bit, there, are, there is evidence that, um, of, of, of certain genes being in common, uh, the, the genetic bases of local adaptation for these two species share some genes. So how do you go about identifying the genetic basis of local adaptation? It's actually it's, it's quite complex. There's uh, lots of different ways of going about it. So imagine you've got a situation like this. This is just a, obviously just a cartoon. Imagine we have some species of conifer. Uh, it's distributed across the, the western part of North America. Um, the, let's say that the tree's environment is it's the shading within these little icons. You've got this kind of latitudinal variation in the environment. How would you go from this kind of situation to identifying the genetic basis of local adaptation? One very, very common and popular method is something called a genotype environment association method. These methods have been alluded to throughout the, throughout the week, um, but I like to get, help everybody understand what I'm thinking about when I'm talking, so I'm gonna break it down a little bit. Um, it's a potentially quite a powerful way to identify the genes that contribute to local adaptation. It works a little like this. Imagine we've gone out to this hypothetical population and we've sampled individuals from different parts of the species range, indicated by the, the black horizontal bars represent the genome of an individual. Um, and the color of the box that they're in represent the environment that they were sampled from. And so use, using sequencing techniques, uh, oops, pardon me, 
uh, you identify genetic markers, usually SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and ask, is there an association between the presence of a particular genetic marker and environmental variation? And in this case, this black blob represents a SNP that has a strong correlation with the environment. You could look at another SNP and you might find no association whatsoever. And you basically just march along the genome asking, do, do we find any, any markers that have an association with the environment? That's the fundamental basis of a genotype environment association analysis. That is what they're doing. They get quite statistically sophisticated, but at heart, this is the test that they're trying to perform. And so when you do a GEA, you end up with data that looks kind of like this. This is uh, what we call a Manhattan plot. The y-axis is some test statistic. In the case of a GEA, it might be the minus log 10 of a p-value from a correlation test or something like that. And the x-axis is position along, along a genome. So here we have, uh, on the high up on the y-axis means genes that have strong evidence of having some correlation with the environment, G uh, points that are low, or so each point belongs to a gene, I should have said. Points that are low down represent, you know, no, 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 no strong evidence. How do you go from this kind of data to trying to identifying the genes that are involved in local adaptation? Well, it's kind of tricky, because these methods have some pretty big issues. Um, the biggest issue, I think, is with, these, with these methods is we don't really have a good way of characterizing the statistical null distribution for these. We don't know, okay, on this particular test statistic, if a value of nine, what does that mean? It's nine. It could be minus log 10 p value, minus log 10 p value of nine. That seems quite striking, but it's kind of hard to interpret it unless we know what the null distribution is, what to expect by chance. And these various factors, population structure, demographic history, and recombination rate variation can all influence the nature of the null distribution uh, in population genetic genome scans uh, <clears throat> in ways that we can't really characterize very well. So it makes it really, really, really hard to know whether a particular score is high or low. So should we draw our significance threshold and say genes that are above this red, dotted red line, these are ones that are, have striking evidence for local adaptation, should we draw it there or should we draw it there? I don't really know. I don't know the answer. I don't, I'm not convinced that many people do. Um, one of the things I really like about that analysis that, uh, that Yeaman and Hodgins did is because they, 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 they were leveraging the fact that there is convergent local adaptation in the different conifer species, the fact that you see the same genes popping up in different lineages provides stronger evidence that they are actually doing something rather than they're just some kind of noise from, a, 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 you know, noise from an un undescribed null distribution. Oop. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, this is another one, just kind of a silly pop gen nerdy thing, which is that even if you can characterize the null distribution, there are multiple independent processes in evolution that can lead to similar patterns in data. I mean, that, that's also another wrinkle to the, to the story. But the, the, the Yeaman Hodgins logic still holds. Oops. Okay. So in the co adaptory project, we've taken the data for interior, from interior spruce and lodgepole pine that was analyzed by Sam and Kay. Uh, and added in data from Western Larch, the Douglas fir, and the Jack Pine. And so these are really, really quite uh, widely distributed species, as you all know. The data we're generating is quite, is quite extensive, at least 40 popula uh, 30, 35 populations of each species, deep, se uh, deep uh, sequencing of, each of, of, of lots of different populations. We also have three additional European species that we've, we've grabbed from the public record, although I'm not showing their maps just because this is a North American conference. Okay. Uh, right, yeah, so we used a, a technique called pooled exome capture to identify genetic markers all, in all our different species, the ones that we've added to the existing data sets. And we performed genotype environment association analysis using a method that we developed throughout the co adaptory project that we call the WIZA. Um, and the WIZA just happens to be a little bit more powerful than the pre existing methods. Uh, okay, so I've talked a little bit about the G in genotype environment association, but I haven't really talked about the E. Um, of course, you need to think about what aspects of the environment may be important for local adaptation when you're doing these scans. And so we, we you can, you know, using Climate NA or Climate, um, Climate North America or something like that or WorldClim, you can get, a, you know, a, math, a smorgasbord of different uh, climate variables that you could look at. Of course, there's a big correlation structure amongst many of those, and it's kind of hard to know exactly which ones to use. So using the correlation structure, we kind of winnowed it down to a set of seven uh, variables um, that uh, we kind of thought would be particularly important for conifers. So for each of these different envir environmental variables, we perform a genotype environment association for each of the different species. So <clears throat> we end up with data that kind of looks like this. So here's Doug fir. Uh, so we've both got, got, got both coastal and interior Doug fir in our data set. Um, 
Doug Fur, Jack Pine, Western Larch, Interior Spruce, and Lodgepole Pine, we can get data that looks kind of like this, right? These different Manhattan plots for all the different species. With the Yeaman and Hodgen analysis, what they were doing is they said, okay, we've got two species, we can go, okay, if, is there strong evidence for a pair of pair of species? That analysis was by no means easy, but it's a little bit more straightforward than combining results for five species or more. So we developed a method that we call Pikmin, um, which is the idea of Pikmin is it combines information in a kind of a meta-analysis framework that allows you to pool information from lots of different genome scans. Um, if you're interested in specifically how it works, I'd be more than happy to talk about it. Um, but basically what it allows you to do, it allows you to take a several different genome scans and combine them into one. And so you can get a, a, the, a, the strength of evidence that a particular gene, or uh, yeah, gene in, in, in the case of our analyses, shows up as having stronger, the ev stronger evidence than you'd expect by chance of being involved in local adaptation for more than one, uh, more than two, species, two or more species. And so just as an example, uh, here's uh, our analysis for latitude. Um, the y-axis here is a minus log 10 corrected p-value, uh, p but it's p-values that have been corrected for false discovery rate, so they're q-values. Uh, and the x-axis is just some uh, arbitrary index just for plotting purposes. The color of these different points indicate how many species exhibit evidence for using that gene for adaptation. Um, and so there's, there's just two nominal significance thresholds. We did specify our significance thresholds. Uh, we pre-registered them using this, 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 this pre-registration thing you can do for scientific studies. We pre-registered our significance thresholds, which I was very glad that we did when I saw this result, because this line is right below these points. Uh, nevertheless, um, this one over here is particularly interesting because it's nominally significant and also has evidence of being, uh, of, of being used by seven out of uh, seven species. Um, and that gene happens to be CRR1, which is a circadian rhythm gene, and this happened to be a GEA that we had conducted on latitude. So I don't want to get too carried away interpreting these things, but that is kind of, uh, is quite an intriguing result, but as I said, don't want to get too carried away. So we can take all of our species, we can take all of our genome scans and plug them in through this framework, and we can ask how many genes, or actually, we're actually using orthologs across all our species, so I should be saying orthogroups, but 115 orthogroups or genes with significant evidence that they're being used in at least two or more conifers. Um, and so there's variation among the species, uh, variation among the environmental variables. This is very much ongoing work. We're still tweaking things because uh, there were some issues with some of our European data sets. We're also going to be doing some uh, kind of analyses looking at different functions and so on uh, of those, of those orthogroups. But for the time being, we certainly have some intriguing results. Um, Oh, there's a blank slide. So, <laughs> thank you all very, very much for listening. Um, as I said, I would really, really not want to give the impression that this is work that I've been doing on my own. This is a very, very much a collaborative project uh, that I've, uh, it's, been, it's been really, really, really great. And uh, yeah, so thank you to everybody who was involved in the project, particularly these people on the slides, and thank you all for listening and uh, for the last couple of days. Question for Tom. Thank you. Thank, sorry. Thank you very much. It's a very uh, exciting presentation. I have one question. Kind of, I'm not very sophisticated at this. So several several species may have some common genes highlighted in the end. Is it possible that in maybe they are just part of the, the quantitative trait? So you select, let's say, one out of 10, but in the end, all of these 10 genes should be together to make them operated and uh, pre, uh, express the local adaptation. Is it possible? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, didn't quite, I didn't quite follow. Sorry, could oh, you sorry. repeat the question? You, you put the several species together, and there are some genes up there. They are strongly correlated to local adaptation. But is it possible that they, it's just overlapped part? But some of them may not be overlapped, and all of these genes should be together to make the local adaptation work. I'm not sure. Just curious about that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think that. Well, that's the idea of this Pikmin method. Oops. Ah. This one. <laughs> the idea of this thing is it's it's allowing us to try to say whether or not the whether, like, let's say. Oh, ah. Gosh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> any given point, right? It sits somewhere on these different graphs. 
And it's it's not just saying like, there's some you know some take a, some slice of these distributions and asking you know do you see the same thing over and over again. It's a little it's it, it's modeling things a little bit more uh, concretely than that. But the yeah that it's that's what it's trying to take care of is that it's way more unexpected than you do, than than chance that they're they're showing up there. Is that does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry <laughs> sorry if I misunderstood. Tom, uh, super cool, Tom, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about the pre-registration and maybe if you could talk about the advantages, pros and cons of doing that. Yeah, so we, um, so I'm supervised by Mike Whitlock, who is um, a wonderful guy, um, and he's very keen on pre-registration. And it's kind of a statistically sound thing to do when you're doing a kind of a, um, it's, it's, it's been widely adopted in medical trials where you are, you plan out some experiment and you want to make sure that people aren't manipulating their data or their significance thresholds after the fact of doing an experiment. To make sure, to hold, basically hold people's feet to the fire to do what they said they were gonna do beforehand so you don't get publication bias and these kinds of things. It is really, we, we were thinking, so at the time we were kind of getting started with this, Mike had just given a talk at Evolution where he was talking about the use and misuse of statistics in evolution. And at the time, he was very, very keen on pre-registration. And he got us all very excited about doing it for this particular project. It's been a bit of a challenge, really, because as we, when we pre-registered, we had to say, oh, we're going to use a significance threshold of x. We're going to use methods y and z. And that, it kind of, it, it, in a certain way, it kind of held us back a little bit. And so the strategy that we adopted was we inevitably had to deviate from our plan, our pre-registered plan. And so we've basically just come to the conclusion we're just going to have to write a point-by-point -point document labeling, like outlining why we deviated from our plan to begin with. The big lesson I've learned is that in, it, it maybe isn't the best thing for exploratory studies, which is, this is kind of an exploratory study in a sense. But there, it, I still think it is really, really good to force people to think through what they're going to be doing before they, uh, before they get going. Because, you know, if I hadn't have written down, if we hadn't have written, I said I, I said, I should say we, if we hadn't have written down this significant threshold before the point, before the, before the fact, right, we might have read this data and gone, oh, actually, you know, an FDR significant, uh, the threshold of 0 0.6, that's pretty strong evidence, and so we'd go for that. You know, so that's, I'm glad that we did it, but uh, I think that it's, there's a really, really, it's kind of hard to balance the, the needs of an exploratory study to actually just explore the data and find out what patterns are actually there with trying to do things in a statistically robust and defensible way. I, I, yeah. I haven't come to a firm conclusion about what I, what I think is the short answer. Okay, I think, I think we can fit in one more question. Marie has the mic. I do. Sorry. Um, this is the plot I actually wanted to ask about. I really love this, and um, it's interesting because with the seven species, you're like, wow, that's amazing. But then with the two species, what I was curious about, are you seeing those two species points coming up more frequently for more closely related species, like the jack pine and lodgepole lodge pine, or the Douglas fir and the larch? A little bit, a little bit. There is some signal, there is some phylogenetic signal in the data. Um, uh, in a previous talk, I've got a follow, I don't think I included the phylogeny in this one, but um, the, certainly, uh, we, we, um, we structured our analysis in, in such a way that we weren't including things that were too closely related in any given comparison, so it would kind of be silly to include Doug for interior and coastal in a comparison because we know that they just, they're sharing genes all the time, so it would be kind of silly to, oh, there's convergent evolution. Well, that's kind of what you'd expect. So we didn't do that. But you, if you, even if you separate that out, you do see some signal that when you've got an independent analysis that there is some evidence that, say, lodgepole and jack pine share uh, are, are a bit more similar, and dug for interior and coastal are definitely very similar. Uh, the western larch and the firs are a little bit more similar as well. But it's, it's not particularly strong. It's not a particularly strong signal. Okay, let's thank Tom one more time. So our next speaker is Melanie Zacharias. Oh, she fixes her mic there. <laughs> Got it. And she comes, uh, she is a postdoc at Laval University, and she's going to be talking to us about genomic offset of populist tremuloides. Yeah, um, much more people here than I expected for the last talk, so thank you. <laughs> 
Um, few words about me. So I did my PhD in Germany on white spruce actually, so I had field work in Alaska. But in January I came to Canada to start my postdoc at the Université Laval. And it's one of the projects I'm working on, which is a genomic offset with Impopius tremoloides, a keystone species in North America. So, Isn't it the arrow I have to hit? This one. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so as we all know, the climate is changing, and especially boreal forests run more than the global average. And also the IPCC uh, reported that climate change induced uh, increased drought-induced tree mortality, as well as forest insect outbreaks and wildfires. And so what do we need to know? We uh, need to know how do trees uh, need to be genetically equipped to cope with the future climate, and how do we get resilient seedlings for planting and reforestation. And to try to answer to some of these questions, I use the model species Aspen. So as you can see uh, on the distribution range on the right, it covers a wide range has a wide distribution range over North America, uh, but here I have to say that um, this distribution range only shows like one third, which is actually covered in Mexico. So the distribution range is actually bigger in Mexico, um, but I'm still on the hunt for the shape file which represents this. Um, yeah, it's an important keystone species. It plays a crucial role in uh, many ecosystems and it covers uh, riparian habitats and as well as areas which experience surf drought. It had different reproduction strategies, so it relies on natural disturbances and has uh, more sexual, uh, sexual regeneration, uh, which is more often in eastern North America, including Canada, and relies more on cloning in drier areas like Mexico. It can also occur in polyploids, um, which occur more often in drought-affected areas. And there's also the hypothesis that uh, for the future Canadian climate, that there are the Mexican populations are suitable, but this hypothesis has actually never been really tested. So the questions I wanted to answer are, uh, or, yeah, the aims are I want to identify environmental variables which drive the genetic clustering and also predict the potential uh, genetic maladaptation to future environment, uh, which is also called um, genetic offset or genomic vulnerability or the risk of non-adaptiveness. So choose whatever you want. And uh, we want to know so how uh, the populous tremoloides populations are equipped for future climate conditions. And so to know the relative risk of future maladaptation from the point of today. And when we are doing this, we want to like at the same time um, delineate the distribution range in some eco zones or seed zones, which are not yet existent to have uh, this potential eco zones to harvest seeds for future uh, reforestation programs. How are we doing this? So uh, we are using the program Gradient Force. It was already mentioned a few times during this conference. Um, this is an extension to random forest. So it's a machine learning approach, which combines the output of multiple decision trees into a single result. And the advantage is that it has a high accuracy, uh, flexibility, and uh, quite simple. Um, the aim is to identify change points along gradients and model spatial variation. So the initial um, model was, uh, program was developed by Alice et al. and it actually was developed to a model like species composition. Um, and, but instead of species, um, Fitzpatrick and Keller, they used uh, loci uh, among genomes. So they used it as a landscape genomic approach using SNPs um, to model the allele frequency turnovers along environmental gradients. So as you can see, 
on this graph on the right, we have the cumulative impotence, so we do not look at the single SNPs, we look at the cumulative impotence, and we want to see at which um, point, so we have here, for example, the environmental variable summer, um, mean summer temperature, and at which point, for example, 13 degree, does the um, allele frequency change, so where do we have a turnover? Um, and also with this program, we want to um, analyze the genomic offset or vulnerability. So we have uh, our current climate and um, assigned allele frequency. And when the climate is changing, for example, an increase in temperature, we want to know how does the um, allele frequency has to change to cope with the uh, future climate conditions. And what we also would like to do with this uh, program or the results of this program is um, to delineate the distribution range into eco zones like it's already done in this paper um, with seed and breeding zone so delineation. And which uh, data do we use? So I use a data set which was um, already uh, published in this paper. So as you in light green, you can see the distribution range and our um, sampling um, represents well the distribution range. So we have um, over 900 non-clonal uh, deployed individuals, which was uh, genotyped by genotyping by sequencing, and it um, represents different ecological uh, conditions, our sampling, including also drier region like the western US or Texas, and yeah, it's sampled in US, Canada, and Mexico. Um, so we use different data sets for gradient forest. We use the full data set with uh, all SNPs, then a neutral one, where we only included intergenic SNPs, and also two candidate data sets. In this candidate data sets, there are already uh, SNPs included, um, which already showed some association with the environment, which were um, in one data set identified with LM LFMM program and the other one with the variant. And we also included the environmental matrix, which was the uh, average of the climate in A variables between 1961 and 1990. And because gradient forest is not able to uh, incorporate population structure, we use the Moran's eigenvector map variables to account for spatial autocorrelation. And here are the first preliminary results, so the variable um, importance within the models. Um, you can see like the different data sets we used, and the darker the color is, the higher is the importance of the environmental variable. And the variables which showed the highest uh, importance, I just um, wrote them here, so they all have something to do with precipitation, moisture. And yeah, but surprisingly, the neutral data set still had some quite high values. I still have to figure out why this is the case. And um, you can see that the two candidate data sets, they, which where the candidates identified by different programs that they differ in their um, variable importance. And then we use gradient forest to um, predict the genomic variation, which was predicted by the trained gradient forest model for the current populous Tremoridis um, distribution range. And I here only use the um, candidate data set Bayern. So the output, they looked quite similar of the different um, input we used. And so you can see that um, similar colors show a similar genetic um, composition. So we can see, yeah, that it differs in Alaska, but this region is quite similar. And then, um, yeah, further we tried the uh, ecosome delineation. So we used the results of the PCA cluster to delineate the zones. And yeah, here you can see um, how to choose the cluster. So yeah, which is not, I think not that, easy to identify how many clusters to use. So I guess um, to use just one or three clusters would not be uh, good to represent the uh, different environmental conditions the species is experiencing, but also to use um, too many 